start with a prayer. So I would ask uh, Sheikh Yahya to please come uh, and, uh, say, and say, a, uh, say a recitation of Surah Al Fatiha as well as the translation, and then we will start the program. Sheikh. من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا استعينوا بالصبر والصلاة إن الله مع الصابرين ولا تقولوا لمن يقتل في سبيل الله أموات بل أحياء ولكن لا تشعرون ولنبلونكم بشيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الأموال ونقص من الأموال والأنفس والثمرات وبشر الصابرين الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا قالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون أولئك عليهم صلوات من ربهم ورحمة وأولئك هم المهتدون. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I will be speaking later on, but for now I'll just translate and give you a synopsis of the verses of the Quran that I just recited. In these verses, God uh, consoles the believing people in their times of loss and grief, wherein He says, O oh, people who believe, you are to seek refuge and you are to take consolation in prayer and patience. And God goes on to tell us that this life, everybody that is alive will be tried and tested in one way or another. And some of the tests that come from God that befall humanity are mentioned in these verses that sometimes we will test you with poverty with affliction, other times we will test you with loss of life and limb and give glad tidings to those who remain patient and steadfast in the face of adversity. And God goes on to teach us the prayer that Muslims recite when we lose a dearly beloved and when we face adversity, trial or grief. Muslims, it is our prayer and that is the prayer that's mentioned in these verses to say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, that we belong to God and to God we shall return. And I, the, the verses conclude by saying that people who remain steadfast in the face of adversity and trial, these are the people who God will show His mercy to, and these are the people who are guided by God. Thank you. Zakhbar thank you. Now this happened on a Friday in New Zealand and we woke up to this news on our Friday and on that Friday people felt a compulsion, they were compelled to bear witness of what happened and people started gathering, they started gathering at Masjid and unfortunately we've been through this before, this has happened before, this has happened in Montreal seven people brutally killed, senselessly killed while praying. This has happened many, many times in churches, in synagogues, in masjid, in temples, and in public places like this where people are indiscriminately, mercilessly murdered in cold blood. For what? For what? Each life is precious. Each life matters, but those lives were snuffed out. And we raised candles, we raised our, 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 our hands, we've embraced each other to keep that light alive. 
of the souls that we have lost and keep the light alive inside each other to warm each other, to comfort each other when this sorrowful event occurs. Now on that Friday, we had many people join us at our Friday prayer, at our Juma prayer in Vancouver. Uh, among them, we had Ravi Kalan, the uh, Provincial Secretary of the Province of BC, on behalf of John Horgan, he spoke very beautifully. And we had um, our Member of Parliament for Granville, uh, which our mosque is located on 655 West 8th, the oldest mosque in this city. And uh, we've been there since 1963. Our doors have always been open, and they will never close. Our doors will always be open for all people. And on that night, well over a thousand people flooded the place, top and, uh, top and bottom, outside with candles. People came because they felt they had to gather. And so many of our, our, our beloved brothers and sisters who felt the pain from New Zealand, so many New Zealanders, they call themselves random New Zealanders and Kiwis, they came. They came and they bore, bore witness and they, they told us what we already knew. This thing has no, no way of happening in such a beautiful place like New Zealand. It should not happen in New Zealand. It should not happen here. It should not happen anywhere. So we know this. And part of what we do is, you know, we have to raise our voice. We have to let people know what we already know. I'm your brother, you're my sister. We are a family and we are together. Now I do have a statement I'd like to read from Honorable Jody Wilson-Raybould on the mass shootings of the two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. Yesterday, 49 people were killed and dozens were wounded as they gathered for prayer at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. That country's worst ever mass shooting, an act of terrorism. We all condemn this act of hatred intolerance and Islamophobia. Al Jamia Masjid Vancouver is the oldest mosque in BC and the second oldest in Canada. Today, we stand in solidarity with you as we support your community and join all who are gathering throughout our city, region and nation as we mourn with New Zealanders and the Muslim community around the world. We honor the lives of those who are murdered and pray for the recovery of those who are injured, as well as the families and loved ones of all who are affected by this act of horror. Senseless acts of violence, as we witnessed in Christ's church, are a painful reminder of the need for vigilance against all forms of discrimination, which have no place in our communities, cities, or nations. With love, acceptance, and respect, we have the strength to combat such atrocity and overcome. In reflection of our own humanity, we must strengthen our collective resolve to build a world where no one or no group experiences violence or intolerance because of the faith they practice, who they are or where they come from. Rather, we must live all of our lives for a world in which we all are free to live in safety and peace. We are one. You and I are one. Our humanity is one, grounded in peace and love that connects us all. We are here for you today and always will be to help, to heal, to support in whatever ways we can and you may need. May the Creator guide us all. Galaxala, Honorable Jody Wilson-Raybould, Member of Parliament for Vancouver Granville. I appreciate these words. Now, my dear respected brothers and sisters, a place of worship is a place where you should feel safe. And um, I've been asked, what do you do? Well, you do what those brave people did. The brave people who lost their lives, they. They tackled, they tried, they tried their best, and one succeeded. A hero succeeded, and, and, and they stopped the carnage before it could get worse. But sometimes you have to give your life to save a life. And it's a very hard choice to make. 
But if and when that happens, and we pray it never happens, it's better to give your life than see so much life wiped out for no reason. It's a hard choice, but if ever I have to make it, I will do so unhesitatingly, and I hope you will too. Because we have to make the world a safer place, not just for me, not just for you, but for our children and their children after us. It's a hard choice. My dear respected brothers and sisters, the next speaker is a very dear friend of our community. He helps keep us safe. He helps keep our country safe. He's represented the constituents of Fraser, Fraser, uh, Vancouver, and he's acted very nobly, very strongly as our Minister of Defence. And it's my deep, deep honour to ask Harjit Sajjan to please come and share his words and his wisdom with us today. Assalamu alaikum. I first want to acknowledge that we stand on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people. They welcomed us with open arms and they continue to welcome us with open arms. Whether you came here 10 years ago or over 100 years ago, we are all immigrants to this land. And we gather here today to honor the 50 people who lost their lives at the two mosques in New Zealand. They lost their lives because of an act of hate, an act of barbarism. It was an act of a terrorist who meant to spread fear and hope to divide us. 50 people were killed and many more were injured. They were targeted because they were Muslims practicing their faith. They were targeting their place of worship among family, among friends, amongst their community. Our place of worship is a place where we should feel more safe. It should never represent fear or sadness. Sadly, this type of heinous acts occurs all too often. And we are not immune in Canada. We remember the senseless act attack on the Islamic Cultural Center in Quebec that took many innocent lives. In the shock and sorrow following events such as these, we often ask why. Why would someone do this? Why did this happen? And there will never be a good answer to these questions. And there is no reason that these questions should have to be asked time and time again following the Senseless Violence Act. We're unfortunately living in a time marked by growing hate and fear. We're living in a time where the progress we have made together towards equality and understanding has slowed. And that is, it is in danger of going backwards. That fear comes from ignorance. It comes from not making an effort to know your neighbor or to learn about their culture and traditions. And many of us in the crowd have felt the brunt of that ignorance in the form of racism. This racism can be outright hostility, or it could be just simple prejudiced remark. All of us have felt that racism. Now it goes back to that basic fear that has been created. And I say created because fear of your neighbors is not natural. There are people out there who seek to divide us, they seek to exploit the divisions for their own gain and their own agenda. They want to create an atmosphere of mistrust and fear. And we cannot let that happen. As Arun said, we must stand up when we're, whenever we see an act of bigotry. No matter how small it may seem, we must take an effort to come together regardless of faith or ethnicity. We must understand that our diversity is the foundation of our strength. But most importantly, we must not let leaders get away with saying nothing. The silence of those who do not condemn these acts of terrorism show their true character. Those who refuse to acknowledge that this terrorist act was directed at Muslims 
also show their true colors. We have a responsibility to ensure that an attack like this does not happen again. That means that those voices that call out for hate must be drowned out. And those voices that remain silent must be called out for what they are. As my good, as my good friend, Minister Hussain has said, hatred has consequences. And sadly, innocent people like the 50 Muslims who died are the victims of those consequences. As we honor the memories of those that were lost, let us resolve to stop prejudice in any of its forms. Let us strengthen our society based on trust and understanding. And let us ensure that our places of worship, whether it be mosques, churches, synagogues, temples, or gurdwaras, are safe for our families and our communities. And I join all of you and those around the world in condemning the terrorist attacks in New Zealand. We do not fight hate with hate. So what can we do? And I've said this many times before. Succeed. Achieve your goals. Do not let anyone prevent you or your children from finding the success that you have defined for yourself. So let us honor by succeeding and creating a better world without hate. We stand with you. I stand with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Archie. We, we, we deeply appreciate your words. Thank you. Our next speaker, our next speaker is a very well-respected uh, Muslim scholar in the Lower Mainland. Imam Yahya Momla has been serving the community in Lower Mainland in BC extensively. Uh, he is specifically the Imam of Masjid Al Salam in Burnaby, um, and he'll be addressing a very specific topic when it comes to ending ignorance. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is the Muslim greeting which means may peace and blessings of God be upon all of you and all of us here today. Ladies and gentlemen, while we are gathered here to share in the sorrow, the grief, to show our support and our solidarity with the victims of last week's cowardly terrorist attack, if you noticed, the actual title of today's gathering is End of Ignorance. And I have been told and I have been directed by today's organizers who I believe share in this sentiment of mine that the key to stopping hate, to stopping bigotry, to stopping Islamophobia, to stopping anti-Semitism, to stopping any form of hate is education. And it is only with the removal of ignorance and the enlightenment of a society through education that we can overcome those feelings of hate that certain segments of the society may be feeling. And in particular, the topic that I was actually asked to speak about today is the topic of Sharia. Now, many of us, we have heard this word before. Many of us have heard it with, uh, we associate the word with a negative connotation. Many of us, uh, we perhaps our first, first exposure to this word may have been in the aftermath of certain horrific incidents and terrorist attacks that have taken place both in our country and in countries around the world. But really, in reality, in my five or 10 minutes that I have here today, I'd just like to enlighten all of us for the Muslims present over here, this should serve as a reminder of what our Sharia is. And for those of us who are not Muslim, this may be your first instance where you hear the, hopefully, uh, the, the correct understanding of what uh, Muslims believe and what the Sharia is according to Muslims. So the Sharia in general 
This is literally translated, it's an Arabic word, and it shares its origins with other Abrahamic faiths. Literally translated, it means watering hole. So you and I, when we tend to associate the word Sharia with a system of laws as you and I understand them. As you and I, we understand laws. Laws are there to govern your behavior and to punish for certain actions when you do, uh, when somebody commits those actions. Sharia is something far broader than that. So law as you and I understand it, my friends, if, you, if you're looking at it from that lens, the entire Qur'an, we can start there, the entire Qur'an, the holy book of the Muslims, contains more than 6,000 verses. And can anybody guess for me how many of those verses actually deal with law as you and I understand it? Law meaning things like you cannot go when there is, uh, when there is a red stoplight or you know you cannot do a certain thing in a certain place at a certain time you cannot make noise in a certain place after a certain time you know things like that can you just just shout it out for me how many verses do you think deal with law i, I can't hear you guys zero. Well, not exactly zero <laughs> about 90 about 90 verses in the entire 6,000 plus verse Holy Quran deal with law as you and I understand it. So, for the mathematicians amongst us, that's less than 2%. So what is the Sharia if the Quran is Sharia as you and I understand it, and only 90 verses actually deal with law, then what is the Sharia? Now, when we talk about ending ignorance, it's, I would like to point out, and I won't defile such, uh, such a blessed gathering with, by mentioning the name of the particular uh, Australian senator who actually said these words, but he referred to Muslims and the Islamic faith as fascism. Now, appreciate the, iron, uh, the, the ironic nature of this claim for a moment with me. A far-right politician is labeling a faith group as fascists, right? So what is Sharia? Sharia, as Muslims understand it, I'm going to give you some examples. Sharia is bearing testimony that we believe in the oneness of a creator who is merciful. Sharia is our belief in all of the prophets of God sent to this earth, including prophets like Moses, Jesus, Abraham, and of course the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon them all. Sharia is our belief in being just while we are alive and being held accountable for our actions in the courts of God for those who get away with injustice while they're living. Sharia is our belief that we should not sleep on a full stomach when our neighbor is hungry. Sharia is our belief that the best of humanity is the person who is the kindest and best to his neighbors. Sharia is our belief that a believing person cannot attain the pinnacle of his faith or her faith until all of humanity is safe from the harms of their tongue and speech as well as the harms of their actions and limbs. Sharia is our belief, the Muslim belief that we should venerate and show respect and regard to our elders and show kindness to the weak, the fragile and the vulnerable amongst us. Sharia is our belief that society works better when we respect each other despite our differences and our different ways of doing things. Sharia is our belief that God does not allow compulsion in religion. And I was asked specifically to talk about this point. That, again, the same senator from Australia, again, not mentioning his name, it's, I, I wouldn't want to defile such a beautiful day and such a wonderful gathering by mentioning his name. That's why I'm not going to give him the honor and dignity of actually mentioning his name, but I'm sure many of you know who I'm talking about. He made it out to seem 
that all of these wonderful people that you see over here, many of whom are Muslim, are here to somehow take over and somehow impose their system of laws and morality on the entire society. And the very, and I'm going to end with this, that inside the Quran, inside the Quran, the holy book of the Muslims, the canon of Islamic law and Sharia, God makes it crystal clear, la ikraha fi din, that there can be no compulsion in religion. It is not allowed according to what? According to the Sharia. Ah, for a Muslim to impose his or her system of beliefs on a neighbor who is not Muslim. Rather, we are commanded and shown by example in the life of our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that he respected the other faith communities, both pagan idol worshippers as well as the Jewish community. And in an instance, when he was visited by the Christian community, he respected them all. And we have verified authentic reports that he allowed the Christian community their place of worship in the courtyard of his own mosque. So my friends, when the next time somebody comes and tells you that the Muslims, they believe in this strange system of code and law that they call the Sharia ah, and they're out to get you. And you know, they want to change the way you believe and they want to impose their draconian laws on you. Then you tell that person. And I, I, I draw inspiration here from uh, the Honorable Member of Parliament, Terry Beach, who was sitting next to me last night. And he said, you know, Imam, I used to let things slide. That when somebody made an Islamophobic remark, or sometimes an anti-Semitic remark, I would sometimes let it slide. That, you know, maybe this person out of his ignorance, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But in the aftermath of the Quebec shootings, I make it a point to not let anything slide. The moment somebody makes the moment somebody makes an insulting, degrading remark about somebody else's faith, somebody else's gender, somebody else's ethnicity, somebody else's way of life, that is the moment that we should speak up. And if all of us that are gathered over here begin to do this, the moment we see somebody make a racist remark, it doesn't have to be Islamophobia. The moment we see somebody make a racist remark, somebody make a xenophobic remark, somebody make uh, you know, a, 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 an insulting remark regarding somebody's gender or somebody's way of life, somebody's faith, then we speak up about it. For I believe sincerely that a small group of committed people who are going to speak up in the, in, in the face of tyranny and injustice. And by the way, because you know, I usually don't carry notes with me. That's why I tend to forget things. But I, I'm sure if I go back to my notes, then this was in there. That the Sharia ah says that you are to speak. It is, it is, a, it is a commandment of the Sharia ah that you speak truth in the face of tyranny and injustice. So when you see something happening, then it's your duty as a human being. And if you're Muslim, it's your duty in the Sharia ah to speak up and to not allow that. You don't have to agree with everybody's way of life. You don't have to agree with everybody's faith to allow you to speak up when somebody's faith or somebody's way of life is being insulted and degraded. So thank you for this opportunity. And as far as ending ignorance is concerned, this is my last point over here. I invite everybody present over here who is not Muslim to visit some of our friends that are standing in the fringes and in the corners of uh, today's gathering with some material for you to read. Visit a mosque. If you have a Muslim colleague, ask them about their faith. Sometimes, you know, as Muslims, a lot of us, you know, because we're not so visibly Muslim like myself sometimes. So we, we may feel a lot of our Muslim, uh, you know, friends over here, they may feel shy to tell you about their faith. But believe me, Muslims love talking. Muslims love talking. The moment you ask them, they're going to open up. So if you have a colleague that wears the hijab, or if you have a colleague that 
has a beard. But by the way, if you have a colleague that has a beard, don't automatically assume that he's Muslim, okay? Right? So uh, that in itself may be offensive to some people. So. So visit the mosques, ask your Muslim family members, ask those of you who have Muslim colleagues and classmates, ask them about their faith and see how they open up. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. And yeah, let's hear it for our sisters. Let's hear it for our sisters. Mashallah, we're all brothers and sisters together. My dear respected brothers and sisters, it's a tough time. And everybody has something to say. And sometimes you can't say it. And it, it festers, it bottles up. And sometimes you act out in the worst possible way. This guy, this lunatic, <coughs> this brother, this guy, fellow human being, bottled up hate in himself, bottled up hate in his mind, and acted on it methodically, planned it meticulously, and executed, executed in the most horrible way possible. Welcome, welcome, mashallah. And we got our kids. That's what we do it for. We do it for our kids. Got it. So it's important. You know, there are people out there that are sick. They're sick. And they need healing. And they need help. We say we should all have hikmah, wisdom. You know, some wisdom. And you only achieve wisdom when you learn. You know, when you're young, you're full of vim and vinegar, and you think you know everything. I'm an older guy now. I realize I don't know shit. <laughs> but you learn. You learn. And as you grow older, I, I find wisdom at the feet of a child, at the white beards of my brother Musa here, at, uh, uh, and in front of all of you. You teach me how to be a better human being. Because bottom line, that's who we all are. We're all human beings. Now, we have a lot of sisters here, but I'd also uh, uh, like to ask them, you know who you are. The New Zealanders and Kiwis that came and spoke and sang, please, if you could make your way to the steps, too, we'd like to, to make accommodation for you. Sister with the sunglasses there, I, you, know, you especially. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's very important that we share our voices together, that we sing to each other, that we recite poetry to each other, that we... We recite the verses of our holy books and traditions to each other so that we, because we were brought on this earth, made in nations and tribes, not to fear and mistrust each other, but to know and love each other. And this translation is from Quran, it's from Torah, it's from the Bible, it's from many, many traditions. It is a universal truth. I'm just, I'm just here with the microphone stating the obvious. It's an obvious thing, but people don't get it. And it's sad, and it's horrifying when people die, when people lose their lives. For what? Somebody had a bad day. Somebody felt that their job was taken away. Somebody felt their culture was taken away. Somebody felt their supposed perceived supremacy as a certain member of a certain nationality via their lack of pigmentation or abundance of that separates them and makes them superior to you or me or anyone out here. The reality is we are a human family and we have to act like that. We are. You got it. We are. Now the pain of this occasion was felt very keenly here in our city, and with a very dear brother of mine. Shokit Khan serves as our current president of our Pakistan Canada Association, and he too is a trustee of the Al Jamia Masjid Vancouver. And he went to high school with a very dear friend. And um, I'd like Shokit to tell his story and tell it in its entirety. It's a heartbreaker, but he has to say it. 
because that's the way he's going to honor his friend and his brother, Shokit Khan. Thank you very much, Arun. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Peace be upon you. Uh, very unfortunate moment for me to be, and time for me to be standing here, uh, remembering my uh, childhood brother, my friend. Uh, we went to high school together in 1986, and the name Rashid is the one, the name you uh, see on the media nowadays, uh, because he was the one uh, who was in the masjid at that unfortunate uh, uh, time when that uh, terrorist attack happened, and he was the one who was trying to um, uh, take that uh, shooter down. And in that in attempt, uh, he lost his life, and unfortunately, his uh, uh, elder son, who was 21 year old at the time in masjid, lost his life too. So I've been called upon to talk about why would it make uh, Naim Rashid uh, to lose his life uh, where he could have uh, just gone on the side and uh, saved his life. But if I look back uh, in our high school time in the city uh, of Pakistan called Abbottabad, uh, we, grew, we grew up together. We spent four years together. Uh, but when I reflect on uh, the time when, when everybody is a clown and they were trying to have fun and they were trying to bother each, uh, uh, um, uh, each and everyone in the school, uh, Naim Rashid used to be somebody who was very humble, who was very poised. Uh, we always used to call him a scholar because he used to have glasses and uh, very intelligent, one of the top students in the school who was always involved in community work. If I reflect back on his family, I know his uh, mom who's being flown away from Pakistan to New Zealand as we speak. I did have a chance to talk to uh, Pakistan Canada Association representative Mr. Farooq in Auckland and he was telling me that uh, Naim's wife who is the vice president with the association uh, is very actively involved uh, uh, in the society to give back to the society to make a difference in the country they live and to make a difference in the community they live. Uh, but looking back at uh, Naeem and the way we grew up together, he was somebody who is always out there helping out other people. If somebody is hurt in the playground, he's the one who's found uh, sitting in with that individual and trying to help him out and make him feel better. Anybody, if they, we get into a fight, he's the one who's going to come in and he's going to put peace among us and later on say, hey, you know what, we are from the same school. What are you guys talking about? Lots of things. And the moment I hear, uh, think about it, lots of things that uh, flash and they go through my mind about uh, uh, where Naim Rashid was and where he is right now. Uh, our uh, uh, current Prime Minister Imran Khan just announced in the morning that he is uh, conferring uh, the uh, highest civilian award uh, in Pakistan to Naim Rashid. Uh, but um, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it is very encouraging to know that he is being recognized for his hard work and he's rec being recognized and I thank you all of you for being here uh, for uh, um, remembering that uh, uh, heinous attack, uh, attack and also to show that we all Canadians, no matter which faith we belong to, no matter uh, uh, which uh, religion we follow, we are all together in this and these events are going to make us more and better uh, uh, Canadian citizens and bring each and every one of us together. So thank you. This is the best thing we can do to remember. What a hero. What a hero. My dear respected brothers and sisters, we're going to have the sisters speak in a few moments, but uh, before we do, we got to let the gray beard be. It's, I got a little touch, touch of gray in here, but uh, our chief, we got some. This man's got to speak. He is the granddaddy of our, uh, of our uh, uh, community, has served as uh, president of BC Muslim Association for many years. Brother Musa Ismail, my dear brother. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So I am not going to make long speech. I'm a man of action. And I'm going to call on each one of you. We're going to start off with saying, taking action. So I want each one of you to turn your to your right and say assalamu alaikum or greet the person on your right, please. Start now. Turn to your right and say salam. Now you turn to your left and say salam. At least you should know the name of your neighbor. You should know the name of your neighbor. This is why 
This is why we are here. We are here to join hands, not in sol not only in solidarity of the of our brothers and sisters in New Zealand. We are here also in solidarity with each one of us, irrespective of the religion and the faith you follow. We are all Canadians. We are all first and foremost human beings and we must respect each other. Two more points. Most of you know or do not know that a young bunch of brothers and few sisters got together a few years ago, almost three years ago, under the banner of Islam Unraveled. Unraveled means unraveling Islam to those who do not understand Islam. So this group, I want you to know, this group has been to many synagogues, been to many church groups, we have been to all the RCMP in every contingency in Lower Mainland. We have been to many hospital people to teach them and show them what Islam really stands for. Not because of lecturing them or converting them so that they can understand and deal with our sisters with hijab, with our older people with, as requires special requirements. Just like Judaism, Christianity, we are here to teach and help and educate each other so with, it, with education we get rid of ignorance and when we get rid of ignorance we get rid of hatred and bigotry in our society. So help us, join us and start educating. The third and final point. We have been also talking to our MPs, MLAs, to start thinking about teaching in this beautiful country of ours. I've been here 50 years. My children grew up here. They are professors, uh, professionals in, and in their own right and growing with their grandchildren. And many, many such examples of Canadian Muslims who've been here more than 100 years have made their mark and they continue to do so. We've got hundreds and thousands of doctors and lawyers, professional engineers of all kinds becoming very core members of the society, what is called Canada Canadian Society. And the most important thing that each one of you can do is please talk to your MPs MLAs, your council members, that they need to open up just like they did for LGBT people. They need to talk about how do we educate our children from elementary to high school about different faiths. And just think about it. Teaching our children about different faiths and bringing tolerance amongst them. 20 years from now, they will be shoulder to shoulder with no fear and no bigotry and no intolerance in this society. So we need to start from the youngest age. So, with that word, with that word, I just want to convey my condolence to all the family that passed away currently, now in New Zealand, in the past, and we hope and pray. All our prayers should be that God save us from such incidents in the future. And the only way we can Avoid that is by education and becoming better brothers and sisters in this Canadian society. Canada can set a beautiful example if we ourselves set a beautiful example. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bai. Thank you so much. Mr. Svall, ladies and gentlemen, there's an MP right there. RG, you, you got him. He's right here. So if you, if you want to go and talk to him, he's very approachable. He's uh, uh, and, uh, all of our members of parliament, our MLAs, our city councillors, all the people that make this city, this province, and this great country run, they're all approachable. No matter what their party is, they serve you. They serve you. They are here for you. And we want the best for each other as a human family. Now, things happen. Some bad things happen. The sister I'm going to ask to speak, 
had a tough thing happen to her, riding the sky train, just relaxing, taking it easy, and some idiot assaulted her. And she stood up for herself, and it was noticed. And it's this thing that happens in a terrible situation, something good can come from it. And this, this, my sister, this Muslima, this beautiful woman, found more of herself in her poetry and her speaking, and she's going to share her poetry and her voice with us. Sister Noor, please come and share your knowledge and your wisdom. Thank you, sister. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace be upon you all. What if it happened right now? Right here where I stand holding a gun in his hand. He aims it up, he pulls the trigger. People duck, I duck for cover. Bodies fall all around me, screaming loud, down on my knees. I try to crawl out the door, but he guards it up, stuck on the floor. Nowhere to run, no place to hide, stuck in this place, prepared to die. Hear the screams, I hear the cries, children lifeless, bodies lie all on the floor without a sound. While their loved ones try to pick them off the ground, but he runs out, escapes to hide. As others come in, he was disguised. He wore a mask on his face. He ran away as we picked up the remains. He knew not one of us, not even our names, but killed us all because of our faith, because of our color, because of our race, because of the fear he hears in the news. He never bothered to ask, so he continued to choose what was true and what were lies. He targeted us to take our lives. Never trying to ask, he only ever believed. The media against us, that showed us as enemies. He entered with an idea and left with no shame. Believing we were the villains, he thought he won this game. He believed he can succeed by leaving our blood all on the floor. All he left was with this crime. The moment he stepped out the door, the moment he ran, drove away from the scene, as far removed the mask out the window, threw the gun out the car. He didn't care about the details. He only cared they were dead. Believing that if he killed every last one of us, the world would not flood red. It was hypocritical of him. He believed we lived to kill others. Yet it was his hands that are stained with the blood of our dead sisters and brothers. He left the mess we had to clean, blood stained the floors to families. What were we supposed to save? How do we explain that their mother or brother had been murdered away too soon of time, too soon of stage? Their son was 15 years old, entering the masjid to pray, entering the synagogue to pray, entering the temple to pray, entering the church to pray. Their son was only 15 years old. Because of a man who saw color wrong, who saw our religion as hate, used his own faith in his religion to murder, to suffocate, to keep us silent in fear, he assumed he knew best. Used the name of God to honor our murders, believing the devil's test. To him we were the chaos, the ones who were insane, who used religion to hate that we, that he was the one that was okay, KKK. Because when a white man murders lives, killing one or two or more, they go straight to the mental illness, dismiss the situation and move forward. Not even thinking that maybe, just maybe he was fine. That it was the media he viewed that made him believe these ignorant lies. It was because of his hate did he try. It was because of his hate that they died. It was because of his hate that these lives are no longer living. They are no longer giving. They are no longer loving. They are no longer growing. They are no longer laughing. They are no longer trying. They are no longer here. What if it happened right now, where we stand, holding a gun in his hand, holds it up and pulls the trigger. I tried to hide, we ducked for cover. What happened if he did it right now? Because he did, because of his hate. Thank you.
Sister Noor! That is light. That is light right here. Sister Noor, thank you so much. Yeah, my dear brothers and sisters, we are a community is made of people that volunteer their time. And you can volunteer. You can spend time. There are people volunteering to stand watch in front of our mosques. We saw that uh, the, the Sikh community standing at our Surrey Mosque. In Christchurch, New Zealand, people said, I'll stand in front of the mosque while you pray. We'll come to your synagogue. We'll come to your temple. We'll be there for each other because that's what we have to do. Now we have a community volunteer here, Hamza Malik, who would like to share his words and his wisdom and what we can, what we can do to volunteer. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. I salute you with the Islamic greetings of peace, blessings, and mercy. May the peace, blessings, and mercy of God be upon you. Up until now, we've had an entire conversation centered around the rhetoric of hate, Islamophobia, of love, of countering and overcoming hatred and overpowering it with love. I wanted to come at you from a different angle. You see, Imam Yahya spoke about the importance of speaking truth to power because that is, a, that is a tenet of our religion and that is a tenet of who we are and what defines us. So, allow me to use this opportunity to talk about the root causes that fuel the types of incidents that took place in New Zealand because certainly these sorts of events don't happen in a vacuum. And forgive me if it seems like I'm ruining the vibe. Uh, I've been told I tend to do that a lot. I simply want to point out some stark realities and we need to realize that it's not just a matter of a sick, deranged gunman. It's not just a matter of someone with hatred in their heart. What we're seeing and what we've been witnessing is the, pro is the result of years of foreign policy. The result of, a f of, of years of rhetoric, of media bias, of systems and institutions that have reinforced attitudes that have otherwise the Muslim community, that have otherwise Islam as a set of ideas that is foreign to the Western experience, that have treated us like outsiders despite us having grown up in these communities. Now, when you see policies like the counter-extremism measures that are taking place in the UK, that have, in a, that have forced the general public to view the everyday Muslim under the lens of suspicion, when Muslim schools and schools and mosques are being vetted because of so-called extremist content without contextualizing, without engaging with the community, when people are being exposed and inundated with rhetoric, with ideas by figures such as the uh, Australian Member of Parliament who blamed the Muslim community for the massacre that took place because apparently it's the Muslim community that has brought the problems to their land. When, these re when this rhetoric is flamed, framed this way, when we, look at what the when we look at what the manifesto of the gunman said, it's very clear that there was, a drift, there was an ideological drive behind what he said. It's high time we start recognizing that and it's high time we start realizing that worldwide, when, a, when the Muslim world is being drone bombed, when the Muslim world is being destabilized, I have to point this out, let's be real. None of this happens in a vacuum. None of this happens in a vacuum. You think, do you honestly think, and I'm being really, really upfront, we've gathered here to show our mourning for the victims in New Zealand. And that was a tragedy. Understand something, as Muslims we grieve, we grieve but we're not afraid. As Muslims, we cry, but we don't despair. We are concerned, but at the same time, we take solace in our hearts. Death is not a fear for us. We do not fear death. It's easy to say, I understand. But our, the penultimate destination is that experience of death. That's not something we fear. To those who have come, to the ordinary citizens, to those folks who've come to help and show support, I'd like to thank you all. I'd like to extend a welcome to you to talk to us, to engage with us, to have conversations with us. Yeah, we love to talk, I love to talk. We love to have conversations with you and tell you about who we are, what we're all about, what our religion says unapologetically. So let's recognize the years of foreign policy. Let's go back to that. The administrations that exist down south not just the current administration, but the one before that and the one before that. And the rhetoric and the way the conversations have been framed that have radicalized, yes, radicalized the types of people that did the attacks like they did in New Zealand. 
So radicalization isn't a one-way street. It happens from a myriad of figures, a lot of political stakeholders, the way we enforce it, let's recognize that, let's work against it, and let's be a community that engages with each other without fear. So with that, that was my two cents. I'd like to thank you all. Uh, please enjoy the rest of the event. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Anthony. That was great. So we all come into this world. We come into this world as babies, little ones, and hopefully we grow up. Next speaker I've known since she was minutes old, as a baby, as a little girl, as a fine young woman she's become. She's now recently completed her law degree and she's embarking on a new career. But I still see the little baby and this amazing woman before me. Mina Khan, please come. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, when the shooting happened, I was um, in downtown and I was uh, met by a lot of people and a lot of people see me wearing a hijab and they're very nice to me. They smile, they open the doors for me. And for those people and the people in the future who see me and treat me with kindness, even though I wear a job, thank you in advance and thank you to the people in the past. But on that same day, I was um, going on the bus and a woman said an Islamophobic comment to me. Uh, and because of the shooting, I was already in a vulnerable state. But I have to, I really, I was thinking about it a lot, about why she said that to me. I've had a lot of comments to me uh, because I wear a job and it's um i i definitely feel like um it, it it is hard sometimes but it's the best blessing to wear a hijab for me and i'm very thankful that i have islam in my life and so i wouldn't take it off just because people are mean to me in high school good as I could look because like and you know like all girls know like the hijab doesn't like sometimes do favors for you but you still wear it for Allah and then so I was thinking about it a lot and um, yeah like in high school a lot of people used to call me a terrorist for wearing a hijab and and uh, I just want to make it clear to everyone that first of all my name is Khan and I'm not a terrorist and if anyone gets a Um, that's really important is that okay um, my whole life I feel like we use the word terrorism and then in our mind like we automatically think about Muslims or Islam but I think it's really crucial at this point of time to say like look Muslims can be the victims of terrorism and so that's something like I want to try to disassociate that word terrorism with Islam or Muslims so um, that's something that I wanted to point out and then after that one that experience I went to the Nisa helpline um, fundraiser and if any Muslim girl is feeling um, like they need support you can call that hotline it's free they give counseling and uh, you don't have to talk about like it doesn't have to be about hijab you don't have to wear hijab you could be abused or you could have depression anxiety but use that helpline Especially now, apparently after the shooting, a lot of people have been calling that helpline because we're disturbed by what happened. And so for everyone else, I just want to let you know about that. And then I think, um, I, don't, I don't feel bad about that woman and I don't think she's a bad woman. I think she's gone through a lot of issues herself. She was, she was homeless and, and um, uh, looks like she had a lot of issues going on and I feel like the best thing that we can do as a society is help people that are marginalized who are um, not going through um, like good times and like it doesn't have to be like the uh, serious like things but just do your part to like help the society if we help society then people won't have extreme views so yeah 
Do you guys please do the way become a successful lawyer and I can help the community, Muslims and non-Muslims. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Vinay. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. So now on that Friday, we, we are going to be having the Salat. We are going to pray together. That's the other big thing too. We're going to pray together today. And uh, they'll be setting up in the next 15 minutes or so. The prayer will start. But part of what we share is not just our prayers. Our prayers are so important. But our prayer comes in many forms. Our prayer comes in the gaze of kindness. Our prayers come when we hug each other and greet each other. Our prayers come when we protect each other and shield each other from harm. Our prayers come when we sing to each other. The woman that I, I'm very honored and very blessed to introduce raised her voice in, in song, in the traditional song of the New Zealand people. I'd like you all to really greet our very lovely sister, Louise, to share her song with us. Uh, so I'm Louise and I'm from New Zealand um, and I think I want to say on behalf of all New Zealanders here that um, it's an excruciating thing to be away from home when something like this has happened to your home country and we thank you very much for allowing us into your community and allowing the chance to group with you. On Friday night, I sort of explained what a waiata is, and in New Zealand, in Māori culture, the indigenous culture, when someone comes to speak um, at a, in a traditional way, we support them with a song. Um, and the song I'm going to sing now is called Te Araha, and it's about bringing people together in love and in peace and in listening to each other. Um, and I'm assuming there's lots of Kiwis in the audience who know the words to sing along, so please do. Yeah, To all the New Zealanders, we're with you. We're with you. We love you. You know, you're going to hear another very beautiful voice. Louise, thank you so much for sharing your voice. Now, Imam Musser, who, uh, if you could please make your way here. I've known him, and uh, he's, he's a jewel of a man. He's in the jewelry business, but he's, uh, he's, he is a jewel. And he, uh, he's acting as a, an imam and faith leader in Langley and uh, minister, ministering to our people there. And he has a very lovely voice and uh, we'd really love you to share. Thank you. Thank you. Bismillah. Peace, mercy, and blessing be from Allah upon all of you. It has been said each one acts in accordance with his concepts. People only act in accordance with their, what they believe. Actions and behaviors are nothing but a manifestations of thoughts, concepts and beliefs. We have seen the horrible action from that murder in New Zealand against Muslims. Regardless, I'm not here to ignite more emotions, but although to bring those emotions and use them as fuel to set the right ideas and to reason 
and ponder why this is happening. When we say people's actions are nothing but reflections and manifestations of their thoughts, that means when people are trying to fix a problem, you cannot do that by only enforcing laws and installing more legislations to say this is prohibited and this is not allowed and we won't allow it. Actually, the right field for people who are in power, uh, who are influentials to work in is the field of concepts, fields of thoughts, and fields of beliefs. This is the area that people in charge has to fix thin laws, thin enforcing laws will have a meaning. For people who are really willing and wanting to repair and fix any kind or such a problem, they have most likely two major tools. First, media. Second, education system. Both have failed to actually set the right concepts for our living. Media have been fueling hatred against Muslims for decades. Media has created a new religion for this world that's called Islamophobia. Religion which has many followers and many supporters. Islamophobia, it, it has become a religion. Religion where people are suffering from even if they're not Muslim, just because they look like Muslim. And has just many incidents has occurred just because they look like Muslim, just because they have a beard. The media as a tool, it doesn't work by itself. There are people who have systematically worked hard to install all the bad materials and deliver it to people by this media. We don't want to discuss why they're doing that. But what we have seen, and what we, have, we, we see, and we will see, is just a result for what the media has done. Second tool is the education system. If you look at the education system in the schools in North America, in Europe, and so many other places in the world, for me, I look at my, the social studies for my kids, they teach them about ancient China, ancient Greek, ancient Egypt. They taught them everything about what happened in Europe, in China, in Africa. All of a sudden, they jumped to the modern history. They literally skipped 1,300 years of Islamic civilization. They only mention Islam as people of desert and camels and tents. Probably they will also add and illustrate a picture of Kaaba. That's all they do. They ignore deliberately a 1300 years of Islamic civilization. Naturally, brothers and sisters, people are fear. They fear what they ignore. They fear what they don't know. If I don't know you, I will open up with you. They ignore this civilization that has been the mother of today's civilization. There would be no internet, there would not be iPad if it wasn't the mathematics of Al Khawarizmi. There would be no NASA existing today if it wasn't the Muslims al equations. There would be no NASA today. With this deliberate ignoring 
of Islamic civilization for our kids, for our students in the schools, in the universities, they create with, well, they know it or not, they create a huge, huge amount of fear inside our kids' minds that these people are different, they have no contribution in our, in our life, in our civilization. They don't know that this civilization they're enjoying today is just a daughter of the Muslim civilizations. So brothers and sisters, and I'll call you all my brothers and sisters, we would like to make a call for those who are in power in this world, for those who are behind the media, behind all the material that people are hearing and seeing across the day, along the hours, about all every bad thing about Islam, that they know they're doing that, and they know they're saying the bad thing, the wrong message. They have to recap their thoughts and reconsider if they really care about the world like they claim every day. I hope we don't get to the point that if Charles Darwin comes back alive, he will congratulate us for perfecting what he has started. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, brother. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be um, uh, affecting the prayers very shortly. We do have a couple of speakers. I want to acknowledge uh, these great guys in the yellow vests here, the, uh, the Vancouver Police Department. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for keeping us safe. You know, when this happened, the first calls we got were from the VPD and the R uh, RCMP. And with that, I'd like to ask my brother, my cousin, and uh, our fellow Muslim and, and a great humanitarian, Tariq Tayyab. Tariq has done tremendous work. And um, as Brother Musa had said, he has really taken this work to, uh, to educate with Islam Unraveled. And we'd lo love to share that with you. But he'd like to share a few words from our friends at the RCMP. Tariq Tayyab. Assalamu alaikum. I thank you all for coming. Uh, we deeply appreciate everybody, uh, everyone's hearts. Uh, we had a, uh, a large gathering at the Vancouver Mosque Friday night, the day after the shootings. And again, thank you again to the Vancouver Police Department for keeping us safe that day, for uh, sending the police officers and patrol cars to all the mosques for the duration of our prayers to keep us safe throughout the province of British Columbia across Canada. So myself, growing up, I used to listen to a rap group called NWA that had a, an anti-police sentiment. And I can honestly say in our work with the RCMP, the Vancouver Police Department, over the last two years after the Quebec shootings, that they called us. They wanted to let our community know that we have your back. We want to keep you guys safe. We do not want you to live in fear that this could happen to you and they, they put their money where their mouth was and they sent the police to all our mosques at our prayers, always there whenever we needed them. One person in particular, two of them, Gareth Blount and Anthony Statham from the BC Hate Crimes team, they visited every mosque on the day of Juma throughout uh, the lower mainland. They probably seen more mosques and Islamic centers than, than even most Muslims. And they came, they joined in prayers. They were there to, to let the folks know that we're here for you. Any uh, instance of Islamophobia or any instance of racism, let us know so we can know and we can help and we can be there to support you. So in keeping with this, Gareth Blount, whose idea was this gathering, he wanted uh, his suggestion, and I'll share with you, he called me after he watched the video of the shooter and I recommend nobody watch that video because it's very harrowing, it's very depressing. I, I unfortunately watched it and it was, it was so heartbreaking that I couldn't function mentally for 24 hours. He watched it, he called me crying. He's with the BC Hate Crimes team. He was crying on the phone. He said he'd never seen anything that horrific. So that's how horrific this was. 
So anyways, he, he sent uh, his statement uh, from the BC Hate Crimes team. It's, a, it's a, just something from Gareth Blount who's helped us with this, uh, keeping our community safe. So he said, the BC Hate Crime team would like to offer our deepest sympathy to the victims of the tragic incident in New Zealand. The RCMP and municipal police represented by the BC Hate Crime team continue to ask members of the public to report incidents of hate or suspicious activity. We will continue to thoroughly investigate incidents that are criminal in nature and also help address the needs of victims. We urge victims to please contact your local police or the BC Hate Crime team. So this is from our friend Gareth Blount. Uh, we're gonna continue this outreach and also we are with our program Islam Unraveled reaching out to other faith-based communities and anyone who's interested in just dialogue. Education and engagement is the way to break down these uh, walls of hatred and bigotry, is to educate and engage again and again over the long term, and this is the way that we're going to solve this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. My auntie is <laughs> She's known me since I was a baby. <laughs> Thank you, auntie. Um, my dear respected brothers and sisters, you know, life, uh, life is a very precious thing and um, I'm going to have to go shortly because I have to pay my respects to my auntie who passed away today. Uh, she passed away this morning and they'll have her janazah and burial today. It's that quick, you know, and uh, somebody I knew my whole life, uh, Sister Henri Yacoub. And uh, we ask that when you, uh, when you do your prayers today, say a prayer for my auntie as well and all those that, that you've lost. Now the next, next sister that I'd like to introduce, um, I've had the, the distinct honor to serve with her at an event organized by Islamic Relief, organized by Sister Fatima Ben Hatta. Sister Fatima Ben Hatta, a very, very important woman who's done incredible work for our community. Thank you, Sister Fatima. I'd like to ask Sister Samaya. She is a poet. She is a speaker, she is a volunteer, she does incredible work, and she's a scholar as well. So I'd love her to, for her to share her words, her wisdom, her poetry, and grace with us here today. And with that, I thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Mr. Sabah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, Sister so I was just kind of a, I wasn't prepared to speak, but I will I will share. Um, I want to start off by thanking all our allies that have came. It means a lot um, for, to our community that you show up and you, you stand with us in solidarity for the 50 lives that were taken and murdered. I just uh, shortly want to um, talk about and speak on behalf of um, Muslim women, especially specifically visibly Muslim women. Um, yes visibly Muslim women because we are the warriors really in our society. I was born and raised here in Canada and I was born in a post 9-11 world where I had to struggle to accept my identity and because it was con I since I was a kid in the media everywhere growing up in high school my identity was constantly being vilified constantly being questioned I didn't, I didn't actually wear the hijab until a few years ago when I was 19 years old. And I made that choice because I decided not to be afraid of who I was as a Muslim woman. And my message to Muslim women is to not be afraid. It doesn't, we are not afraid. And you know what? A lot of, a lot of Western and Canadians or Americans might think, oh, you know, because she's born in Canada she's modernized or something, but no, it is in our lineage, the women in our history. They were educators. They were warriors in the front lines of oppression. This is our ancestors we are following. We have not been liberated by Western society. We have been liberated by our faith. So hold on to your faith, educate yourselves. And do not be afraid to be strong, wear your hijabs, go on the sky train, face your enemies, and continually speak out, use your voice, you tell your stories on social media, do not be shy, show the world who you are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maya. We, we have two more speakers before we commence for the prayer. And after our prayers, there will be an open mic. 
every single one of us are affected equally. We have emotions that we want to share. So you will have an opportunity to share your words after prayers. But before we get to that, a very important individual from our community, uh, Brother Iltaf Sahib, who's the chairperson of BC Muslim Association, has a few words to say. Brother Iltaf. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I know the emotions are high, and we're all affected by what has happened in New Zealand. It's a tragedy that's affected each and every one of us, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. But whenever a tragedy like this happens, there's always a positive twist to it. Since the time the news of the shooting came, I must say that the government of Canada has been very supportive in so many different ways. RCMP has been calling me and has been working very closely with Brother Tariq here, Alhamdulillah, and giving us contact numbers and all the contacts, email addresses for each and every one of us who would need help or would like to talk to them. They had arranged security at each and every mosque on the Friday days of prayer. And we are very thankful to them. So you see, this tragedy has brought us all here together and has united us all. My message to the haters is we will not fight hate with hate, but we will fight hate with love. We will fight hate with education. Our mosque our doors, our mosque doors will be open to each and every one of you. Whenever you feel like talking to us, learning about Islam, learning about our values, we will show you the love and the affection and we'll give you tours of our mosques. You will see the love that we Muslims have in our hearts. And we will all work together and we will be united as we are today. <coughs> I would like to thank our Prime Minister for taking a, a strong stance on this and call, calling this a terrorist attack. Yes, yes, yes. And it all started from the words of the New Zealand Prime Minister. And I'm very thankful to her for calling it what it is. And this has conveyed to the other Prime Ministers as well. And we, as leaders of each and every nation, should point it out that this was an act of terrorism. And no one, no faith, no religion would support any act like this. And not the, may the Almighty Creator protect all of us, no matter what race, what religion, what background we are from. And we should put a stop to these type of acts. And we pray for the families who have been affected in New Zealand and, and the families here who have been directly affected with the families out there. We thank all of you for coming here today. We thank the provincial government as well. Mr. John Horgan has been very supportive as well, just as the federal government. And we thank all of you for coming here today. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Brother El Taf. Now I stand here and I look at you and had a few words to share, but it's almost like my mind is empty. A uh, few days back, there were 50 extra lives on this face of earth, but today they're gone. They're gone due to ignorance and hate. The terror attacks in New Zealand, they were rooted in pure ignorance and pure hate. Allah, God in Quran, reminds us to repel evil with what is best. There's a verse which says, repel, repel evil with what is best and your enemy will be like a devoted friend. What is better than education? What is better than love? What is better than wisdom and compassion to overcome hate and ignorance? And I thank each and every one of you. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, if you don't thank people, you don't thank the divine. So I thank each and every one of you for coming out. But I have a question for you. What next? Are you the same person you were on Thursday? 
Am I going to be the same person I was before knowing about this incident, before understanding and being aware of the reality of the world we live in? This world is filled with ignorance. This world is filled with hate. And it is up to us to bring a change within ourselves to overcome these challenges. And lastly, I have a message for those who want to perpetuate hate. You do not scare us. If you want to fill our mosques with blood and bullets, we Muslims and non-Muslims will fill our mosques with our prayers, with our sincerity, with our devotion. We will make our mosques centers for education, centers of wisdom and compassion. To my, to my fellow Muslim community, to my fellow Muslim community, we need to change. We need to bring a change within ourselves. The faith that is within our hearts needs to manifest into actions. We cannot keep talking about education and not step out and outreach to people. We cannot keep talking about it and not actually engage with the wider society to bridge the gap that exists. We cannot live the way we've been living and expect things to change. Lastly, I want to recite a few verses from the Quran and I will not give you a translation for those who don't understand because I want you to reach out to the closest Muslim you know and ask them what is being recited. Allah says in the Quran, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر Thank you very much. Uh, please do reach out to your Muslims. If you didn't understand what was recited, please reach out to a Muslim and ask what it meant. Uh, we will be we'll be joining uh, for the prayer now. Every prayer is preceded with a call to the prayer. And I ask uh, Brother Hamadullah uh, to come up and make the call to the prayer. Uh, once it's done, we will all proceed uh, towards the carpets that have been put up and, 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 uh, and join in prayers. Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Allah Akbar أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله 